Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Film for Fans podcast, your home for movie news, reviews, and movie fan views, the podcast from movie fans for movie fans. I am your host, Ryan Dunlevy, joined as always by my co-host, Rob Dunham. Hey, everyone. All right. We've got an excellent show for you. We're going to talk uh, a little Top Gun uh, in honor of Memorial Day, we are going to be talking about our favorite war movies. Uh, we will hit uh, a the first of a two part series on the on the movies from 2012, as that's the 10 year anniversary. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years since 2012. And then, of course, we will do our watch list. Rob, are you ready to get started? I am. All right. Ah, box office is where we'll begin this today. And uh, for last weekend, tops at the box office for the third week running, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness takes in $32.3 million, uh, bringing it to a grand total of $342.8 million domestically. Uh, number two, in its first week in the box office, Downton Abbey, A New Era, Pulls in 16 million to take second place. The Bad Guys, five weeks in a row in the top five for the Bad Guys, as it pulls in 6.1 million. It has a total run of 74.4 million. Sonic the Hedgehog just never gives up, man. This hmm. movie is quite the long run. Seven weeks in the top five, pulled in 4.1 million this weekend. And uh, to wrap out the top five, another new entrance to the box office, Men, at $3.3 million. Uh, we will have to mention, because we want to talk about it a little bit, coming in at number six, once again, pulling in another $3 million, everything, everywhere, all at once. This movie has made like between 3 and $5 million basically every week of its release. It's incredible. <clears throat> uh rob what do you make of the box office um not surprising that dr strange continues to make money and didn't have like as significant as a drop this week mm -hmm. um which leads me to believe it might stay around for a few more weeks and make some more money um especially considering it's not got some not really has a ton of major competition i mean top gun i guess is decent competition we'll see how audiences react to that i'm still unsure how that's going to go mm -hmm. um so i expect uh dr strange to still make a decent amount of money this upcoming week even with top gun coming out yeah yeah i was i was a little surprised men didn't do slightly better than it did um 3.3 million is okay uh but there was also they didn't promote this movie a lot there really wasn't a ton of promotion for it. And I would have, I would have thought that they would have promoted it more heavily. I mean, Alex Garland has had a bunch of, of pretty good hits in a similar genre. So I'm a little surprised it didn't do better than it did. Um, yeah. Downton Abbey. Um, I didn't really have a feel for what that would do in the box office. I'm not sure. I know it's a big audience who watched that, but it's been a few years. So I'm not sure. I guess I just didn't have a gauge on on how big the audience was for that particular movie. So 16 million is a pretty good amount. Yep. All right. So let's let's spend a moment. Just uh, we've talked about it for a couple of weeks, but I think it's worth mentioning. Uh, you had sent the article about uh, everything, everywhere, all at once is now a 24 studios highest grossing movie ever. And that's something to be said for it. Um, it's grossed $47 million. Actually, it's crossed over. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the previous high was 50.2, and it's gone past that now. Yes, it's gone past, and it's gone past that amount. Um, and that's, that's really something to say. I mean, this is a growing studio uh, known mostly for horror, but also a lot of, like... Uh, strange unusual dramas and uh this is this is a big deal for a24 studios what did you make of it um i think that this movie has proved that word of mouth is still a real thing still a viable thing mm -hmm. um, i also think it's 
prove that a wider variety of people are going back to the theater, maybe close to the level that we used to see. Because in order for it to continually make this much money, there have to be new people going to see it mm -hmm. um, every week. Yeah. Because it's not just the same people going to see it over and over again. Um, so for it to be so steady means that it's getting recommended. People are taking the recommendation. Um, also, it hasn't been released on video on demand, and they actually pushed it back mm -hmm. um, to later in June for right now for the release of that. So they're encouraging people to go see it in the theater. Yeah. And I think it's um, it's an interesting movie because it's not necessarily like a huge big screen kind of movie. Yeah. In, in my view, like I think it'll be equally enjoyable at home kind of movie, but still people are going to see it. And I know at least when I saw it, there was something about, seeing it with other people and the reactions to what happened mm -hmm. on the screen that made it a good movie to watch with an audience. And I think that's what we're seeing with the movie. For me, what this says to me is that this particular movie, there was something about this particular movie that engaged a wider audience. It had, it had themes, it had entry points to it. It had a storyline. It had character enough to cross specific genres. So many of A24's releases are niche um, or, or designed for a much smaller audience. But something about this film has captured a wider audience. And that, I think, is one of the things that has allowed it to become the top grossing movie from, from that particular studio is, is that this film went beyond the confines of someone who would typically see this genre and it, and it brought something to the box office. And I, I think, I think to, for me, that is, that is a, a genuine earnestness to the film. And I think hitting a home run with the overall themes and the heart element to it, I think is really what, what broadened its overall appeal. I'm really interested. The article talks about it, but I'm interested in what will this look like around award times yeah. at the end of the year? I, I would expect them probably to re-release it later this year mm -hmm. um, so that it gets some more groundswell for that, because I think this is a movie that should at least be considered for some awards. I and, guarantee you it will yeah. be. The fact that it came out so early makes me think they'll certainly release it again later in the year to get more of that attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it absolutely will be. And let's just face it, there haven't been a ton of contenders this year that you can guarantee are award worthy. And so I think this is the first one that you know is going to be in the year end rewards at some point. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's move on to what's opening this week. There's two movies. Uh, the big one everyone is looking forward to, the Bob's Burger movie. Yes. <laughs> no. Uh, That's juicy. Yes, that one is coming out this, this week. But uh, the big one we're all looking forward to is Top Gun Maverick. Um, it's been a long time for this movie. And not I'm not just talking about a long time since the original was released. I mean, it feels like this movie has been trying to come out for 20 years. <laughs> because they keep delaying and delaying and delaying and delaying and delaying. Uh, so this movie was supposed to come out like two years ago. And it is finally here. It is finally here, man. And I got to I got to tell you I'm excited but I don't know what to expect from it. So that's let's get, let's get into that a little bit. What are you expecting from Top Gun Maverick? Yeah, this is one of the initial casualties of the our original shutdown yes. of everything. Um along with um Spectre, those two movies were uh or uh, sorry, No Time to Die. Those two movies were the ones that or the main ones that just kept on getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like you, I'm just not sure what this movie is going to do because I don't, 
I don't know how much of a connection there is to the original one for people to want to go see it again mm -hmm. um, in a new way. And I don't know how much of a new audience there is that is interested in this kind of movie. Yeah. So I think it's really up in the air. I, I don't know if there's any number that would actually surprise me. Hmm. High or low, honestly. <laughs> um, the fact that it's an IMAX movie and definitely made for IMAX leads me to kind of believe it will have a pretty high number just because yeah. people are going to want to go see it there. Uh, honestly, that is like the sole. That's like the sole appeal to me mm -hmm. is to see like the mm -hmm. the airplane fighting stuff. Yeah, in IMAX, like um, for better or worse, Tom Cruise to me has become Mission Impossible Man. <laughs> and like every movie is a different variation of Mission Impossible Man mm -hmm. to me. And I'm not sure how much I care about uh, his character in this movie. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I get that. All of that is valid. Um, it has been 36 years since the original movie came out, which is hard to believe. I mean, the longevity of Tom Cruise's action career is, is pretty amazing. I mean, he really is. I mean, he's got to be up there. Whether you like him or don't like him, and there's reasons for both, he has to be up there in the running for best action uh, movie star of all time. He he has to be in the top 10, I would think, um, just given the, the longevity of his career. But I think with, with uh, Top Gun Maverick, I think it has a high ceiling and a low floor. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> I can see this movie being terrible or really, really good or somewhere in between. I have no idea where it's going to land. Uh, the danger for a movie like this, when you're when you've waited this long, when you have a really popular movie, you waited this long for a sequel, is that it becomes a really derivative. I can absolutely see them basically rerunning back the exact same plot with just slightly different actors, and and trying to get away with that, or using the same lines or the same jokes or the same you know twists and turns. <laughs> Uh, that they did the last time. I can see it falling into that category. I yeah, that's just head, heading straight into the danger zone. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> uh, but I, I can totally see him doing it. But there's so much, I mean, the world around fighter jets, as I've said before in podcasts, like has changed so dramatically that there's a lot of material that they can go in a completely new direction if they want to. And it's just going to be a question of how much effort did they put into the writing on this one? Yeah. The fact that there was a volleyball scene in the trailer has me a little concerned. Yeah. Uh -uh. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. we will see um best bet do you think it's uh what how, how give me a one to ten how good do you think this movie is going to be you know, based on your guess i uh i think like a six i think as far as box office goes i think i don't know i think it will make more money than less money personally yeah. regardless of how good it is I will go with a 6.5 on this one. I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards the fact that it, that the action and what they can do with uh, the action sequences they couldn't do 35 years ago will be enough to carry this movie across the finish line to being decent. So that's what I got from that. All right. So that's uh, the box office update. Let's move on to our discussion. And we have... Uh, two different discussion elements and ordinarily we don't do two top 10 lists but I will get into why we're going to uh, do the second top 10 list in a moment uh, but this weekend is Memorial Day weekend and so I thought in honor of Memorial Day weekend we could take a look at some of the best war films of all time and there's so many amazing ones to choose from 
uh, from all kinds of different eras and genres, uh, lots of different battles to choose from. Uh, so we came up with a, uh, each of us came up with a 10 best list. Uh, so let's go alternate back and forth. We'll do, we'll do, uh, you know, let's do, do three at a time. How about that? So I don't think mine are actually numbered because I like them all. So, okay. Well, give me more order you want then. Um, so I'll just start my, I, my top one is last or okay. top of my list. So I'll just go. Uh, the rest of them kind of just kind of fall in somewhere, but um, yeah, it's pushing the boundaries a little bit of what a war movie is, I guess. But uh, I have the hunt for Red October on my list. Ah, okay, um, looking at the Cold War kind of holistically. Yeah, in. See, so we should we should stop here and pause for a moment. Is that it is a little bit tough to define war movie genre. It is a little bit tough because I. That one, that one was outside of my bounds, but I can absolutely see it being in bounds because uh, it is Cold War. It is absolutely a Cold War era film. That, yeah, and there's definitely a lot of tension and uh, peril in the movie, which I associate with uh, yeah. war movie mm -hmm. genre. Um, the second one is actually, I have two movies that I think need to be together. Okay. Um, to Because they present like a whole picture when you put them together mm -hmm. and that's uh dunkirk and the dark sour mm -hmm. um dark sour with gary oldman and dunkirk the christopher nolan movie mm -hmm. because they kind of tell two sides of the same story and i i remember having seen both of them that i felt like they informed uh well on each other and mm -hmm. gave you a better idea of what was happening in that situation than if you had just seen one or the other by itself um and then I have uh, Inglorious Bastards. Okay. Mm -hmm. On my list, I out of all these movies, I would say, oh, well, I have one other one that you could call like a uh, two other ones, I guess you'd call like a comedy. Mm -hmm. But um, Inglorious Bastards, I don't know if I would call it a comedy or I'd call it like a, a farce on like the entire war subgenre. Mm -hmm. But I really enjoy how it's written. And I really enjoy how it's shot. And I actually think, despite the fact that it is overall funny, the first scene of the movie where they are looking for the Jews in the basement of the house is one of the most mm -hmm. like tense, riveting scenes I've seen in any movie. Yeah, it's it's incredible. It's an incredible scene. It really is. And uh, I just think, I think it's one of Quentin Tarantino's best movies, personally. Oh yeah, absolutely. It is. It is right up there. I am very hit and miss with Tarantino, and that is that. I am absolutely love that movie. It's it's so so good. It really is. It just missed my list because there's so many good war movies. Um, and I agree with you that Darkest Hour and Dunkirk really do go together. Uh, that being said, I did not choose one of those two movies. <laughs> All right, so uh, 10 through 8 for me. Number 10, uh, 2008, The Hurt Locker. Um, this was a Catherine Bigelow-directed film, Jeremy Renner. Um, and it was, uh, it, was about <clears throat> a, uh, it was about the war, um, the war on terror. And uh, it was about a, um, during the Iraq War, and it's, it's about a bomb squad, a uh, bomb squad going looking for IDs and trying to dismantle it. It's a really intense film. And uh, it was uh, it was a one best picture, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it did win best picture. Um, it won best director, best writing. It, it, it cleared out a number of lists on that one. Uh, so number 10 for me, The Hurt Locker. Uh, number nine, I have Patton. 1970 movie Patton starring George C. Scott. Uh, this is about the famous World War II general, George S. Patton. Um, he is one of the giant figures uh, when it comes to this war in terms of his personality. And it was fascinating about it is that his, he, was, he was a fantastic general and kind of a bad human being. <laughs> but uh, the Germans were so, so scared of him 
uh, and were so convinced that he'd be the one leading the attack that the Allies actually used that. And it's one of the reasons they were not prepared for Normandy because uh, Patton was not in Normandy. He was not headed to Normandy. So they did not think that was going to be the real attack. It was really, really fascinating stuff, but it really breaks down um, the career of George Patton. Uh, so that's number nine. Number eight for me is a personal favorite, A Bridge Too Far from 1977. Uh, this is about Operation Market Garden, and it has a incredible cast. And it was basically this harebrained scheme to end the war where they would, they would launch paratroopers behind enemy lines, and their job was to take and hold a bunch of bridges behind enemy lines. So when the infantry goes rolling through, they have a clear path. Um, and this was done in 1944, but it's got Sean Connery and Ryan O'Neill and Michael Caine and Lawrence Olivier, um, all kinds of, all kinds of, uh, Gene Hackman is in this one as well. Um, just an all-star cast and a really cool movie about, about, a, a, a harebrained scheme that almost worked. All right. What's what, give me three more. All right. So a few more I have here, uh, green zone. Mm. with uh, Matt Damon okay. about the search for WMDs in the Iraq conflict. Um, I think he is, I think this is an excellent character driven story. I think Matt Damon plays the character really well. Mm. Um, whatever your political beliefs or leanings are uh, around this issue, I think that it really just showed um, the frustration that some of the soldiers were dealing with uh being over there which i think was an important thing to shine a light on um completely different feeling a uh, movie that i think a lot of people probably haven't seen that i would recommend is called uh, whiskey tango foxtrot hmm. um starring tina fey and billy bob thornton and hmm. it is about a journalist who is embedded in uh the conflict in the middle east played by tina fey and it's downright hilarious, irreverent, and also like makes you go, "Whoa, that's wild! Like crazy!" Yeah, kind of kind of stuff. Um, there's one scene where they go to a village and they're hiding um, some of the militia people there, and the women will only talk to Tina Fey's character, which is really interesting. Um, she's like, "I'm not cut out for this." She's <laughs> like a journalist, but um, I like that movie and I like the humor in it. Um, obviously the initials spell out WTF. So <laughs> give you an idea. Um, and then I have enemy at the gates, uh, with Jude law, um, about rival snipers chasing each other around, uh, in, uh, is that world war one? I, I think, um, uh, that's world war two, world war two. Okay. Yeah. And, it's, uh, it's a really point. good tense, tense drama piece about these two guys just going after each other and not resting until one of them finds the other that probably should be on my list too i love that movie it's so good it's so well done yeah like you said there's just so many there are and it uh <clears throat> it it really like there's some scenes in there that really really illustrate how brutal the russian front was I mean, that's one aspect of the World War II that we don't focus on because it was Germany versus Russia. But man, the the battles they had, especially the battle in Stalingrad there. And oh my gosh, it was it was brutal. And it does a great job of showing some of that, like uh, and some of the battle tactics was crazy. Yeah, really good. All right. Uh, that was three for you, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, so number seven on my list is Gettysburg from 1993. Uh, this, of course, about the Civil War battle between the North and South at Gettysburg. Uh, crucial, pivotal battle uh, that played a major role in deciding the Civil War. And uh, what's amazing about this movie, in addition to like the shots of the battle, is how well they developed the characters how well they showed you what was going on in the minds of the characters. Uh, so two of the mains were uh, Martin Sheen played Robert E. Lee and Tom Berenger played Longstreet. Both of them were uh, Southern generals. And um, 
from the northern side, um, you have, um, I'm blanking out on his name, um, from Dumb and Dumber, the other guy from Dumb and Dumber. Uh, Jeff Daniels. Jeff Daniels, thank you very much. Uh, so Jeff Daniels uh, plays Joshua Chamberlain, who was absolutely pivotal for the North in, uh, especially in holding of Little Round Top, uh, the bay, famous bayonet charge. Um, really, really, really good movie. Uh, this is the first movie I ever attended uh, that had an intermission in between it because it's long. <laughs> uh, so good movie, uh, Gettysburg. Uh, number six for me, I have Dunkirk. And uh, I, you know, Christopher Nolan is always fantastic. And, and the way he directed this, where he showed three different time periods interlaced, time frames interlaced. Uh, but like the moments, the moments of tension he creates in that with all the shelling and even that that one scene where they're all in they're all getting shot up in the bottom of a of a grounded ship. Uh, just some really, really fascinating things along with that. Uh, so Dunkirk, really good. It's a World War. It's a World War Two battle. All right. And uh, number five for me is uh, The Dirty Dozen from 1967. Classic film. That's another one of those all-star casts movies. Um, the basic plot of The Dirty Dozen is that they decided to take a bunch of ex-cons uh, out of prison and put them in a camp and train them for what would basically amounts to a suicide mission basically a bunch of convicts and they put them on a suicide mission uh, during World War II. And this thing had, had Lee Marvin, Ernest Borgnine, Charles Bronson, Jim Brown. Uh, Jim Brown actually called his retirement in from the set of this movie mm. uh, from the NFL. Interesting little, little side tidbit there. Uh, but the ending battle scene in this is so epic it's so epic where they basically attempt to break into a German compound that has a significant amount of high leverage German uh, prisoners in it. You can see, you can see a lot of what Tarantino did in his movie uh, traces. Uh, there's definitely homage to the dirty dozen in that particular film. All right, Rob, give me three more. <clears throat> All right, so four through two for me. Uh, and I guess these are somewhat in order of my four favorite war movies. I have to look at this list. Um, number four, I have All Quiet on the Western Front mm. uh, from 1930. I've uh, talked about this movie before. I think on the podcast is a World War I movie about the real conflict in the trenches yeah. um, of World War I. And when it came out in 1930, people kind of thought that that was the only world war that was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's kind of sad. It's brutal. It's, it's, it's realistic and um, doesn't pull any punches about the reality of what it was like for um, young men to go to war. Um, back then and there was a remake of this movie made but I like the 1930 version better um, number three for me uh, would have um, Edge of Tomorrow hmm. slash Live Die Repeat okay this might be again stretching what we call a war movie but it is a war it's just in the future with aliens <laughs> so um, this might be one of the last Tom Cruise movies where Tom Cruise was not Mr. Impossible Tom Cruise to me <laughs> so uh I, I really like this movie um and emily blunt's character in it is fantastic mm -hmm. um and i i wish this movie had done better mm -hmm. than it did when it came out because it was deserving of it in my opinion mm -hmm. um just couldn't figure out what to call it and uh number two for me i have jojo rabbit ah yes uh, psycho a cd um it's obviously the highest ranked funny if you want to call it that movie but i um i think when you look at the this movie as a whole the the word that i would use to sum it up is melancholy mm. because there is a lot of funny stuff in it but there's some absolute gut punch moments in this movie mm -hmm. um especially around 
the story of uh, Jojo and her mother. Mm -hmm. And I think it did a really good job of um, showing how absurd and how how messed up it was what they did to kids in that time frame in that country yeah um so obviously it's like it's a comedy but it it has a lot of things that actually happened mm -hmm. um with kids there and um, how they were raised to believe and how um deep down no one is born to hate somebody else mm -hmm. and it, i really like that storyline and obviously um is it is that Tomlinson Mackenzie who plays the nice. mm -hmm. okay um seeing her get some more exposure in roles too I think mm -hmm. she's uh an up-and-coming actress and she does a really good job in this movie yeah yeah um Again, that's another one that, for my definition of war movies, is slightly outside uh, as well. I chose to focus on ones that involved uh, primarily actual conflict and actually amongst the actual soldiers. But that absolutely fits into that war era uh, because it it is all about World War II and everything that was going on in Nazi Germany at that time. So yeah, I can see that. All right, number four for me, I chose Braveheart from 1995, uh, the Mel Gibson Oscar-winning film um, about a Scottish warrior who leads a rebellion and attempting to free Scotland from the British. And uh, this is a, this is obviously a very classic film. Um, the striking look of of Mel Gibson in the blue war paint. Um, lots and lots of twists and turns in this film. Uh, there's there's an incredible amount of depth to it, to the character. Um, really, really expert masterclass storytelling uh, when it comes to Braveheart. Uh, number three for me is one of my absolute personal favorites, I love this movie, is uh, The Great Escape from uh, 1963. And this movie is about uh, a bunch of allied POWs who were so good at escaping prison camps, the Germans decided for whatever reason to put all of their best escape artists in the same prison. As they put it, we'll put all of our rotten eggs in one basket and then watch the basket very closely. Mm -hmm. And so these guys promptly decide to pull off the most audacious uh, prison escape everywhere, anywhere. Um, this film is ridiculous because this all happened. This is actually, the, they had whole departments where they had like a fashion department where they were designing outfits and like actually sewing and making uh, regular clothing. They had a forging department where they were forging uh, different documents um, they had a crew that this whole responsibility was digging tunnels and to see the elaborate nature of what they put on was incredible. There were, there were so many good world war II movies done in the in the, in the sixties and early seventies. And one of the reasons, one of the things that makes them so good is this was less than 20 years after the end of the conflict. Uh, so they had all of the, all of the equipment was still around. So when they were using equipment, they were using the actual equipment that was there. Most of the towns and villages and streets and cities and all that stuff still looked a lot of the same. So uh, uh, to use the quotes from uh, Super 8, production value. There was high mm -hmm. levels of production value. Plus they put great casts in this one. Like uh, Great Escape had Steve McQueen and James Garner, Richard Attenborough, Charles Bronson. Um, just an incredible cast. Uh, that went into uh, The Great Escape. And uh, number two for me, uh, 1917. Uh, 1917 is on unreal World War I movie um, about two soldiers who are on a mission uh, to attempt to save a unit from destruction. And this movie... Uh, delves into trench warfare 
the ridiculousness that was World War I. Um, but the main thing that stands out in this movie is the incredible direction of Sam Mendes and um, Roger Deakins on the cinematography. It is a unbelievably amazing, beautiful shot film. It's done in to appear as though it's one continuous take, uh, which it's just a masterclass film. It just is. Yep, so you'll be unsurprised to know, since I didn't mention it yet, that my number one movie is 1917. Mm-hmm. Honestly. <laughs> um, I just can't think of anything else that I would put above it. It's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's got to be my top five movies of all time. It's incredible. Um, it's just, it's, uh, it's one of the few movies that I have watched every single time I watch it. Even going back to the first time, it never feels as long as it actually is because you are, you're drawn in immediately and you are with these characters. Like you're walking with them through this entire movie. Mm -hmm. It feels like you're blinking and sober. Yeah. It's just every scene is important. Every line is important. Um, The use of light and shadow is incredible in the movie. Just Everything about it is, like you said, it's a masterpiece. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Rob, what you got? That was your number one, right? My number one. Yep. Uh, for me, I had a tough time with, with deciding with this because this is, n- of my personal favorites, this one is not my number one in terms of personal favorites. Uh, but I'll explain why I put it number one, and that's Saving Private Ryan. Hmm. Uh, Saving Private Ryan for me was the movie that defined modern war movies. This movie spawned an entire generation of new war movies that told different stories. And every single war movie that has come out since then has been influenced by what was done in Saving Private Ryan. Um. It, especially the realistic effects. I mean, this movie was known for how, for its realistic capture of the battle of Normandy at the beginning of the film um, and how brutal it was and, and their attempt to make that as, as real as possible. And it was shocking to a lot of people at the time, but it defined what war movies look like in the modern era. So that's why I have it at number one. Uh, simply because of the influence it has had on this particular genre. Of course, a main character being Tom Hanks, and it featured an, at the time, relatively unknown Matt Damon. Uh, but Tom Sizemore, Edward Burns, Barry Pepper, Adam Goldberg, Vin Diesel was even in this, Giovanni Ribisi, uh, Jeremy Davies, Ted Danson's in it, Paul Giamatti. Like, you can keep going on. Like, it's it's an incredible film directed by Steven Spielberg. And there's just so many things about this. It won five Oscars. It won Best Director, Best Cinematography, Best Sound, that sort of thing. Um, uh, just left a lasting legacy. It's kind of what I think of when I think of war movie. It's the first one that comes to my mind. So that's why it's number one, even though it's not my favorite movie. Yes, yeah, it's, it's hard to argue that it's not deserving of that. Um, I just, I, I've seen it a couple times. I just have not seen it enough times to put it on my list here but yeah um, i mean there's no doubt it deserves recognition for what it accomplished mm-hmm. yeah um, i'd also like to mention um although we are a movie podcast i think it's a shame it's just reality that band of brothers is separate from this because kind of band of mm-hmm. brothers to me is like a 10-hour long movie yeah. um and I think might be the best version of a World War II story. Mm. Um, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that it is movie quality um, from HBO. And the performance of every character in it is phenomenal. And there are a lot of movie actors in it. And Damian Lewis playing the main character is, is superb. Um, in this movie playing um, Richard Winters, the commander of the of Easy Company in uh, World War II. 
Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we'll we'll move in here and we'll hit this next one relatively quickly. Um, if you follow the podcast regularly, you will know that there was no podcast last week, and that's because we had some severe audio issues on my end when we recorded it, and so we chose not to publish it because the audio quality just was not up to snuff. Uh, but one of the things we did in last week's podcast was we're doing a couple part series on. Uh, the best movies from 2012, 10 years ago. And uh, last week we talked about the best action sci-fi movies of 2012. Uh, so I wanted to get that in. I wanted to get that part in. So we're going to do that. We're going we're gonna to do our top uh, action movies. And we're, it's top five movies plus two uh, underrated movies that we had in here. Uh, so we're going to do this in a couple part series where we talk about different movies, uh, different genres from that year. Uh, but Rob, why don't you go ahead and give us your uh, give us your underrated movies first? So I realized after we recorded that the reason why I didn't have some of the movies you did is because I looked up 2012 sci fi movies, not so much action. So I'm not going to change my list very much because you hit some that I didn't have. Uh, on my list, but would have um, would definitely say deserve to be on the list. Um, so I, also added, yeah, I added one to my honorable mentions. So I had uh, Robot and Frank, which is a heist movie with an elderly man and the robot that his family gets to help him as he's dealing with getting older and then he realizes he can program it to help him pull off a major heist, which is hilarious. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a sweet movie. <laughs> I also had in my honorable mentions Chronicle, which was uh, about teenagers in Seattle who discover they have superpowers and what would happen in real life if a teenager discovered they had superpowers. And I think it does a really good job of showing that it's a found footage film like Cloverfield. Uh, for me, it's my favorite movie in that sub genre that I've seen. Um, and I just I added one um, from the last time, and that is John Carter of Mars. Mm. I think was a really good movie uh, on its own right but the problem was it asked the audience to like learn a lot yeah um, all at once because this character had never been anywhere before and no one knew who he was or what the deal was so i think that it's a good movie on its own but i think it asked too much of uh general audience for it to gain traction and i think maybe they expected it to become this big movie series, but it never did because the first one didn't succeed. Yeah. That was in the run of Taylor Kitsch movies that ended up being bombs. Yep. Uh, for me, my underrated movies and um, uh, I have Jack Reacher in that uh, really fantastic uh, adaption of the Lee child novel. Um, as I said, it's the only real problem with this is that Tom Cruise is not even close to the physical representation of who the character is in the books. Um, the, if you see the Amazon prime series, Jack Reacher that came out this year, that's a much better physical representation, but the movie is really great. It's, it's about an investigator investigating, um, uh, um, a shooter. And, um, it's, if you like crime investigations uh mysteries cover-ups that type of thing jack reach was a great movie it was undersold uh by the way they marketed it in 2012 uh, my other uh honorable mention is premium rush uh this is the joseph gordon levitt film where he's a bike messenger in new york city and he gets caught up in a uh, kind of a human trafficking uh ring but what's cool about the film is it all takes place over a couple of hours. So the pacing on it is really, really cool. And it's a, uh, it's a different kind of movie because you don't see a lot of bicycle movies, uh, but it's a lot of fun. And, uh, and it's, 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 it's a quality action movie. All right, Rob, what do you got? So give me, give me your, uh, give me everything, but your top one. So these four, no particular order, uh, just movies that I, liked in there mainly in the sci-fi categories i said that's what i focused on um prometheus uh continuation of the alien series that has been derided by a lot of people but i thought was a really solid movie um agree, uh, the, the avengers came out in 2012 the first mm -hmm. 
massive team up movie um, of all the characters from Marvel Phase One. Uh, Looper with Jessica Gordon Levitt and Bruce Willis. I think one of the better time travel movies and a nice spin on things directed by Ryan Johnson, um, yeah. who went on to do Star Wars among others. Um, and Dread with uh, Carl Urban, mm -hmm. uh, the remake of Judge Dread, which unrelated uh, to this discussion is probably, I think, the best use of 3D in a yeah. movie. If you ever have a chance to see it in 3D, it's really well executed. No yeah, that, was, that was on my on <laughs> that was on my underrated list. I really like this movie. It is it is way better than uh, than it should be, and it was really well done. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so uh, five through two for me. Uh, Zero Dark Thirty, uh, the movie about um, the capture and killing of Osama bin Laden and the hunt for Osama bin Laden. Uh, this was one of those that could have been on my war movie list, but because it doesn't focus on the actual battle, I didn't choose to get there. Uh, but Jessica Chastain is amazing in this role with her ruthless tenacity to find Osama bin Laden and just how difficult it was and how much intelligence it had to sort through. Uh, number four, Argo, story about uh, escaping... Uh, a, a few prisoners, uh, well, there were a few escapees of the capture of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran in 1979. And this was the mission to get them out and sneak them out of Iran. And they did so by, by uh, making a fake movie, which is awesome. Uh, one best picture, uh, Ben Affleck was the director of that one. Uh, number three, Born Legacy came out. And as I said, this, I love this film. I think Jeremy Renner did a great job. I wish they would have made more Bond films, but your, or born films, I should say more born films, uh, with Jeremy Renner. I think he was an excellent, uh, character and, and a worthy add into the, uh, the spy genre. And, uh, number two for me, the one you mentioned earlier, Looper, uh, definitely one of the best time travel movies, really unique in its execution and, and the, the, the play between Emily Blunt, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and between Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Bruce Willis uh, is really fascinating, uh, really classic sci-fi fair there with Argo. All right, Rob, best sci-fi action movie of 2012 in your estimation was what? So we... We had previously recorded this, and it was mentioned by Ryan that he is going to have this in a different category. But um, to me, the movie Cloud Atlas is the mm. best. And um, there is one storyline of the five within it that is strictly science fiction. Yes. But the, I mean, the movie as a whole is time bending, traveling, genre bending. Like, it's just it's hard to describe what the movie actually is because it's kind of a whole bunch of things. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a comedy. It's kind of a drama. It's kind of a sci-fi movie. It's kind of a period piece. Um, there's so many different parts to this movie. And um, I love long drama that tells a story. And this is right up there for me. Cloud Atlas with Tom Hanks, Halle Berry, Hugh Grant, etc. cetera. Mm hmm yeah. And number one for me is Skyfall, the third of the Daniel Craig Bond movies. Uh, and this was another Roger Deakins cinematography masterpiece. Um, as I said, I, I still intend to do a breakdown of some of the best visual scenes for this movie because it is a spectacular vis visible um, no, I completely screwed up that that phrase. But it is it is a spectacular visual masterpiece, and um, it's it's everything that Bond can be when it's done right, and um, just so so good. And uh, Javier Bardem as the bad guy in this one is amazing. Judy Dench is amazing. Like it's the best. It's the best of this this role and i think it deserves to be the best of the sci-fi action movies from 2012 
All right. So that's that one. We'll be back next week with uh, another from our 2012 review series. Uh, but now let's quickly go through uh, movies that we watched this week. Rob, what'd you watch? So I mainly watched, uh, I watched a couple of things I've already seen, but I watched something new this week and it was uh, intriguing to me based on some of the conversation we've had around everything, everywhere, all at once. Mm-hmm. Some things we've said about it. So I actually, for the first time, watched the one with Jet Li. Oh, um, yes. Ah, I'm glad you did. Yeah. And uh, I I can definitely see where they got some inspiration for some of the things in everything, everywhere, all at once from this movie. It's a lot of the action sequences. It's very interesting to see how they film some of these things with almost like a stop motion kind of feel to live action martial arts which yeah um i think i need to watch it a couple more times to fully like grasp and understand all the things that happened in the movie um but i i enjoyed seeing him fight against many of himself yeah (laughs) um and it, it is a cool take on the multiverse idea and not many multiverse movies came out before that one. So yeah. um, it is kind of a, a groundbreaking forerunner type of movie as well. The one starring Jet Li. Yeah. And I think what was nice about that is the rules are very clear. They did a very good job of explaining what was going on and how the rules applied in that movie, uh, which I thought was really good. Uh, for me, the main thing that I watched this week is I watched uh, – I think it was 1977 Escape from Alcatraz uh, starring Clint Eastwood. And it was uh, about the attempt. There was one uh, semi-successful attempt to escape Alcatraz. And this basically details what they did. I love, I love prison break movies and, and escape type movies. And uh, this was an excellent version of it talking about how they did that. Um, and I just enjoyed it. You can, if you watch this film, you can see that this was a major influence on the Shawshank Redemption too. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of little subtle things uh, that you can see crossing over into the Shawshank Redemption in 1994. Uh, so it definitely pulled some inspiration from that film. Uh, so Escape from Alcatraz, good movie. All right. That is the podcast. Thanks for tuning into Film for Fans. Make sure you visit Film for Fans website where we have lots of interesting and unique content. We'll try to have some of these lists up there as well over the next uh, week or so. Uh, Until next time, enjoy the movies.